every line must somewhere have an end. In southeast Holland, nothing lay between the British army and the German plain except two rivers and a town. And so we made our plans to send an airborne army down to seize Eindhoven and the bridges at Nijmegen and Arnhem, then to hold them for the force that would sweep up like thunder from the south. Thus, where no line existed, would the Rhine at last be crossed in force. I was to jump last to Darnham, so I sat right forward by the window. I could see nothing but blue skies and Dakotas with the fighters up topside like midges. One of the boys was reading a newspaper. He showed me a funny piece in it. I couldn't laugh. The coast of Holland came along before I was ready for it. Someone yelled, running up now. We got to action stations. I remember thinking, what a bloody bit of bad luck to be bumped off now when the war's nearly over. He's dropping on him, and we come down and go to a place called Eindhoven, Holland. She goes good, we get right, dig in, set up a defense perimeter, and wait for the British Army to come up. And we join them and head out for Nijmegen. The bridge at Nijmegen hardly had a mark on it. We crossed the river and started out for Arnhem, but we didn't get far. The Hun knew as well as we did that we'd got to get through, and he put in everything he'd got. That was the worst I ever struck. Knowing our men were there waiting at Arnhem, and we couldn't get to them. At Arnhem, we got ourselves well dug in, us and some of the poles. We were short of ammo and food. That was our main worry. I'll never forget those supply dropping missions. The way Jerry let loose at them, and the way they just came straight on into it. Towards the end, we knew the situation was bad. We knew we were hemmed in. We knew it was possible we wouldn't get out. More than anything, I remember the way everyone behaved. Men you knew as the toughest fighters became gentle, kind and considerate to each other. I knew a lot more about men after Arnhem. The guns died out in Arnhem. Then we knew the greatest gallantry was not enough to cross the final bridge. And now no choice remained to us. Direct assault against the Siegfried line would be the only way to carve our corridors into the Reich. But first a port was needed for supplies. Antwerp we had, but thundering German guns controlled the 30 cold miles of the Scheldt from Antwerp to the sea. The docks were still, the winches silent, all the ports lay dead, a useless city severed from the sea. It would stay dead until we cut away through the grey Scheldt. So the battle formed to free the estuary for our ships. I covered that battle for the Associated Press. I only wish I could have written the story with the greatness of the men who fought it. It was vicious and fearsome fighting all the way. The Canadians and the Poles clearing the south bank of the river, the Royal Navy and Marines and Norwegians charging knee-deep in blood and water into the mouths of the nine-inch shore guns at West Capel. It was the kind of fighting that makes legends. And the mine-sweeping of the Skelt afterwards it was the greatest operation of its kind in history. The cost of that first ship into Antwerp Harbor was the lives of thousands of our bravest men. I reported it as well as I could, but their memory deserves more than words. I was hauling on the first convoy out of Antwerp. When I got to the front, I saw more empty supply dumps than I liked to see. The boys wanted to know where the stuff was. You can't fight without stuff. Anybody knows that. I made lots of trips. I don't know how many. Driving all day, all night, singing so as to keep awake. Songs like, uh, Milkman, Keep Those Bottles Quiet.
My job was uh, to see to it that they had a new toothbrush and a cot, maybe a book to read when they came over from the East Bank to the West Bank of the Moselle for a little rest. We brought them over one company at a time because that was all the regiment could spare from the line at any one time. Somebody had tapped them on the shoulder and said, all right, boy, you're going back across the river for 24 hours rest. And here they were where they could rest. They just couldn't believe it. Here they were for just 24 hours without war. Everything was down to essentials, counted out like dollar bills through a teller's window. One night's sleep, one day's hot meals, one clean change of underwear, one clean pair of pants, one shave, one hot shower, one movie. I used to wonder what was the best of that day. Was it the chance for him to write home, a hot shower, or that long-legged girl on the screen? Whatever it was, all of it was over by morning. They were going back with their one clean suit of underwear, the hot shower, the clean shave, and the good night's sleep. Back across the Moselle to their holes in the ground. And the shells. By that time, we knew we were going to see a winter campaign. There was no way out of it. The Germans were dug in, and they were tough. And it was plain that until we got a lot stronger, we weren't going anyplace. The squadron was operating whenever it could. There wasn't a lot of flying. We were iced up and fed up. Suppose you're having a swell time in Paris, my cousin wrote me, with all that perfume and silk stockings and that champagne. Uh, they called our end of the line south. We were in the Vosges Mountains with the American 7th Army. But it was very little warmth in this south. I recalled with pleasure the Mediterranean where we had landed in August. Ah, but memories do not keep one warm. Before I joined the army, I'd have thought it was certain death to dig a hole in my back garden and live in it for the winter, but that's what we did. The sergeant said, well, squirrels do it every year. Yes, I thought, but they don't man machine guns as well. There was no heating in our Brussels office. I put on so much under my uniform, they called me the bundle from Britain. I never smoked before, but pretty soon I found myself smoking as high as a pack a day. I worried about that old law of percentages. My company was melting away. You'd look up one day and be fighting alongside a stranger. It was a lonesome feeling. Our hunk of the line was the Yarden. Pretty quiet. A lot of outfits had gone up north. I started a million of the training grounds about the wear and win of our offensive. Then one day I'm standing guard and these shells start. I thought for a minute this was it. Till I realized these shells weren't outgoings, brother. They were incomings. Next thing I knew, German tanks. It was an offensive, all right, but it was going the wrong way. The offensive we were mounting to the north was suddenly forestalled and set aside, as through the rugged, thinly held our den, von Rundstedt struck. He cut a fiery path through the American lines and sent his tanks desperately driving toward the river Meuse. A night of fog and pale December frost saw the beginning. None foresaw the end. He aimed for Antwerp's harbor through Liège. And all our plans held fire while we bent our strength to curb the Germans in the bulge. I was a replacement in England playing shove haypenny in a pub. The next day they shoved me in an aeroplane and that night I was fighting Germans and being kicked around. I don't know about the other outfits, but mine was being cut to ribbons. They were dropping all around me. The thing that still sticks in my head is the medics. The only weapon they had was a needle, but they were around right where it was the hottest. You'd hear that yell, medic, medic, and they'd always be there. Our whole division got a presidential citation for what happened up at Bastogne. Even me, just a cook. I'll never forget that old lieutenant running into the field kitchen and hollering at me if and I had any idea how to operate a bazooka. I said no, and he said, well, you're going to learn now, son. 
I did. And I'll be doggone if in the first shot out the barrel I didn't get me a Jerry Tank. Got interviewed later by Stars and Stripes. They said it was a crackerjack story. I tell it at the drop of a hat. We've been up north where things were a bit static, so we were quite glad to be moved down to the top side of this bulb. Coming down through Belgium, we noticed how scared some of the civilians looked. Natural, I suppose. We were held in reserve for a week, and then they sent us into action. On account of the fog, we couldn't get any air coordination. You sure miss it bad when you've gotten used to it all the way since D-Day. And then on December 24th, like a Christmas present, that sun come up, and after a while, we was giving them the old one-two again. We stopped them dead, finally. It cost us plenty of men, but we stopped them. And we started moving ahead again, the rest of us. Rundstedt reeled back on a recoiling spring. His great attempt was over, and his armies that had devoured such a wealth of blood sagged sodden towards the Rhine. At Yalta then, while dire explosions shook the German fronts, the three great architects of freedom met to fix the final blow and plot the peace. And even as they met, we moved to act upon our strategy. We wished the foe to stand and fight upon the western bank of the Grey Rhine. For there we could destroy him, outside his fortress, open, unprotected by any bridgeless river. Down we cast the gauntlet, challenging him, stand and fight. attacking the north of the Canadians, round about the Reichsvold forest and Dutch frontier area. It was wet and filthy. <laughs> they nicknamed our army commander Admiral Kreler. Well, anyway, the enemy put up some very stiff opposition. But actually, this was just what we'd hoped for. It showed that Jerry's emotions about fighting for every foot of his beloved fatherland were getting the better of his sense of strategy. And every German killed on our side of the Rhine was to make it easier for us on the further bank. And a lot of the Bosch were killed, I can tell you. Reichsvold was the bloodiest show I've seen in this war. It was one of a push. The captain told me eight divisions. He usually knows. He follows things like that. I was with the outfit that took München Gladbach, I think you say it. There weren't many civilians in the streets, and even the ones that were there we weren't supposed to talk to unless we had to. There was a $65 rack for fraternization. I wonder how they happened to figure out that number. I mean, why 65? We could see the Cologne Cathedral a long time before we got there. That tower was our objective. It was on the Rhine River. We went fast, and by the time we got in the town, there wasn't too much fight left in them. Cologne was mangled, all right, but there were still a few buildings standing. I was sorry. I thought of those French cities, flattened. Anyway, we got our objective. Now we had to cross that river. 
I thought they must be very short of men when they put a sailors at a battle dress, lug the assault boats onto trucks and send us across Belgium by road. We talk about silent service. I'd never been sick at sea, but I was sick as a dog on the road. When we reached our destination, I was feeling lousy, longing for a breath of sea air, and found the whole bloody landscape under a stinking smoke screen. A like London it was. The next day we got up to the Rhine. It was good to get a glimpse of the water again. Air Force has given the old lumps on the east bank of the Rhine, but I was still nervous. The Germans had blown the bridges and we knew the crossing would be amphib. When I'm nervous, I get off my feed. For two days before that crossing, I couldn't eat nothing but a couple of Milky Way bars. It was gonna be D-Day all over again. Dangerous. A miracle. There it was sitting there, big and black. I'm no architect, but to me that Remagen Bridge was the most beautiful bridge in the world. In the army, when things go as per plan, that's wonderful. But when they go better than planned, then you figure the chaplain's working overtime. It was a break at that bridge, and we cashed in on it. And the first guys over the river were over in style. The watch on the Rhine was finished, washed up. What a coin of phrase, kaput. okay and everything was going fine but suddenly i gets detailed to guard some german prisoners i'll never forget their faces when their airborne blokes started to come over they just stood there looking up at them and then after about half an hour it one of them looks at me looks up at the sky and says propaganda objective across the Rhine. We and the heavy sealed it off, then the ground forces wrapped it up. After that, they exploded in all directions. Cut the Jerry armies up in pockets, then take them one by one. That was the program. The Third Reich was being carved up like a Christmas turkey. Chasing the Bosch was getting a little bit monotonous. We hardly ever saw him. Only burning houses, a few shells, an occasional sniper's rifle shot. It was a silly kind of defiance, I thought. And then one day the routine was broken. We came across a prisoner war camp, other ranks, Yanks mostly. They went mad when they saw us, screeched red Indian war cries, pummeled one another and asked what the news was. It seemed a shame to tell them when they were so happy. Well, there was nothing for it. I told them. President Roosevelt died yesterday afternoon, is it? You should have held him quietened down. For once in this campaign, they all felt as though they'd suffered a major defeat. I'd have liked to have stayed there, talking to them, trying to cheer them up, but we had no time to lose. Jerry only had a few hundred square miles of earth left to scorch. Our job was either to hurry him up or scorch it for him. We were on the home stretch, cutting deeper all the time, when we ran into these displaced persons, slave workers. They were sick and hungry from all over Europe. The roads were jammed with them, but they kept out of the way and didn't give us any trouble. Like a fellow said, there's a lot more than towns going to have to be reconstructed. I wonder what was up when all RAMC personnel in our lot down to stretch a bed as we're urgently called for. I soon found out we'd taken the Belson concentration camp. Well, I'm not squeamish. I've seen amputations, operations, deaths long before I went to the army in 41. I was a warden. 
I lost count of all the arms and legs I pulled out of the wreckage down in Croydon and got quite used to it. But this was different, very different. I, I don't know any words big enough to make you understand what we all felt. All I can say, and I'm proud of this, is that I had to fall out and be quickly sick in the courtyard. As I say, I'm, I'm not squeamish, but, well, I'm human and thank God for it. The government sent a few of us congressmen over to see those camps. And if there's anybody left who wonders if this war was worth fighting, well, I wish they could have been along. There it was, right in front of us, fascism and what it's bound to lead to, wherever it crops up. I talked to some of the prisoners, the ones that had the strength to talk. Their offenses were the usual Nazi crimes, you know, wrong religion or wrong race belonging to a union or the wrong political party. In Germany, it led to over 400 camps, like the ones I saw. It was the worst thing I ever saw in my life, and I wouldn't have missed it for anything. When gets to moving in a hurry, that's where air transport comes in. We'd been flying in the stuff along with the British Transport Command since D-Day. Towards the end, they seemed to be moving faster on the ground than we were in the air. As pocket after pocket of the foe fell, our hopes rose higher than the soaring flames that marked the broken towns of Germany. In Italy, a million prisoners came in, as with a single sudden blow, the German power was smashed. Then our tanks drove through the southern mountains, where the foe had hoped to make his furious final stand. The Russians took Berlin and cut the heart from Hitler's empire. And he himself, who planned to rule the earth from pole to pole, vanished like smoke among the falling walls. Upon the green banks of the River Elbe, we waited for the east and west to meet. up with the Ruskies at the Elbe River. I hung around for a couple of days with a Tommy gunner named uh, uh, Konnikov. He didn't know any English, so I taught him to say my aching back, and he taught me Tavarish. That means comrade. We drank toast to Len Lease and had a million laughs. Then old Konnikov found an interpreter and gives a toast to the great American soldier. That stopped me. We did all right, but I don't like to think where we'd have been without them. We were going towards the Danish frontier, Bremenfeld, then Hamburg. The rot was setting in. A million and a half surrendered in the north. The fighting was nearly over and our job was beginning. We'd been training a long time for the administration of Germany and we were prepared for plenty of trouble. Sabotage, passive resistance, or perhaps something more violent. You know, werewolves in sheep's clothing. But as it turned out, most of them were docile and did what they were told. They seemed healthy, well fed, their disease was in their minds. A German woman, looking at what was left of her town, said to me, if only you'd given up in 1940, none of this need have happened. After midnight, May the 9th, 1945, the guns stopped. D plus 337. Now it starts. 
all the arguments about who won the war. Well, here's what I say. That no country on earth could have won it alone. So what does that mean? That anybody who wants to take a bow by himself is not only boasting, but nuts. I spent four years in the infantry and I saw my share. And during that time, I only met three men that liked to fight and they were a little cracked, but it had to be done. Now that it's over, I feel good, except for one thing. All this talk about World War III. These big pessimists that talk so easy about another war just didn't see this one, or enough of it. We watched them bringing in some high up prisoners, quite ready to be friendly, some of them. I was thinking of fellas I'd known who'd bought it. Crash, shot down, missing. Right through from the Battle of Britain. I remember their faces or some joke they'd played or maybe just the way they laughed or something. There seemed to be such a lot of them I remembered. To the victor belongs the spoils. That's what they say. Well, what are the spoils? Only this, the chance to build a free world, better than before. Maybe the last chance, remember that. Now the time has come to put our victory to the tests of peace, in company with men of many lands to sift from ashes what the struggle taught. In the rebuilding of a broken earth, May we keep in our hearts this ancient prayer. O Lord God, when thou givest to thy servants to endeavor any great matter, grant to us also to know that it is not the beginning, but the continuing of the same until it be thoroughly finished, which yieldeth the true glory.